Folks, let's turn this morning to the book of Numbers, and we're going to read chapter 10, and we're going to read the first 10 verses of that chapter. Numbers chapter 10, and we're reading the first 10 verses, please. Praise God. Numbers chapter 10, beginning to read in verse 1. And it says there, the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Make thee two trumpets of silver, of a whole piece shalt thou make them, that thou mayest use them for the calling of the assembly and for the journeying of the camps. And when they shall blow with them, all the assembly shall assemble themselves to thee at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And if they blow but with one trumpet... Then the princes which are heads of the thousands of Israel shall gather themselves unto thee. When you blow an alarm, then the camps that lie on the east parts shall go forward. You've got to remember that the tabernacle, by the way, was pitched in the middle of the camp. And the twelve tribes camped in order right around that. Oh, see, because that's what that verse is saying there. Um, if you blow an alarm, then the camps which lie on the east parts shall go forward. Verse 6, when you blow an alarm the second time, then the camps that lie on the south side shall take their journey. They shall blow an alarm for their journeys. But when the congregation is to be gathered together, you shall blow, but you shall not sound an alarm. And the sons of Aaron, the priests, shall blow with the trumpets. And they shall be to you for an ordinance forever throughout your generations. And if you go to war in your land against the enemy that oppresseth you, then you shall blow an alarm with the trumpets, and you shall be remembered before the Lord your God, and you shall be saved from your enemies. Also, in the day of your gladness, and in your solemn days, (coughs) excuse me, and in the beginnings of your months, You shall blow with the trumpets over your burnt offerings and over the sacrifices of your peace offerings, that they may be to you for a memorial before your God. I am the Lord, your God. Just those 10 verses. And as always, we just look to the Lord, trust that his anointing and his blessing will be upon his his truth. Now, we we, we know this section of the word of God. The the children of Israel, they're, they're making, they're journeying. They have been given the Ark of the Covenant. They've been given the the tabernacle to place the Ark of the Covenant in. And as I've just said, whenever they camped down, so to speak, the tabernacle would have been in the middle of the camp and the different tribes, they would have been out around that in order. They all had a certain position that they had to take up in the camp every time they made camp. And here we have what is is known as the, the institution of silver trumpets. You might say to me this morning, well, what really has silver trumpets got to do? Well, we'll unfold that in just a moment or two. But let me just go through one or two things here that we see. Because this is given to Moses immediately after the instructions that have been given to him regarding the movement of the cloud. And this is bound up in a a very marked way with the entire history of Israel. Not only in the past, but also, folks, in the future. You see, there were trumpets blown in that day. There's a trumpet that's going to be blown on a future day. Amen. And trumpets play a big part in the economy of God and in the things that God wants to do. But this was the the communication to the camp, to the people of Israel. This was the communication of the mind of God to his people. And it was in a form that was distinct. It was in a form that was simple enough that all of the people could understand it. Certain blasts would have been made. Certain sounds. Sometimes one as we read. Sometimes two. Sometimes the two trumpets together. Sometimes just the one trumpet. But it would have been distinctive. And it was in a way that people could understand. Even those who were right away out on the borders of the camp. Remember, you're looking at probably three million odd people here. And even those who were right away out on the borders, so to speak, 
of the camp. God took care even of each one of those because they would hear these trumpet blasts that would uh, reveal to them or show them the mind of God or what they were expected to do. That vast assembly, they could all hear. Now, the scripture tells us here that each trumpet was to be made of of one piece. Verse 2 mentions that. Make thee two trumpets of silver, of a whole piece shalt thou make them, both made out of the same silver cast, out of the same molten silver that had, been, that had been placed there. And it appears that every movement in the camp, now folks, let's get this, every movement in the camp was to be the result of the sound of the trumpet. And so by a certain sound on the trumpet, the people would be gathered together in, in, in festive joy, And in worship, by another blast on the trumpet, they would be rallied together for war. Any movement, whether festive or religious or or hostile, it was a result of the trumpet sound. And so we see here that these people really were totally dependent upon the Lord. They weren't allowed to do anything really. Isn't that right? Without the blast and the trumpet, which was the mind of God. The cloud would move to lead them on. And you know, the cloud's an interesting thing because the cloud sometimes stopped and they made camp. And before the day was over, the cloud moved on and they had to break camp. And there was other times the cloud stopped and they made camp and they might have been there one day and had to move the next day. Other times the cloud would have stopped. If you check it through the Bible and they might have made camp, they could have been there for two weeks before the cloud moved. And it seemed that every single movement concerning the people of God had to do completely with what God said. Completely with God's direction. Completely with God's leading. And the cloud would move to lead them and the trumpet would sound to communicate the testimony of God to every single person that was in the camp. Now in verse 8 we are told that it was the sons of Aaron It was the priests who were to to blow with the trumpets. And this was so because the mind of God can be best known and can be best communicated to those who are in priestly nearness and in priestly communion to him. Do you remember the time later from this, whenever they were going to go across the Jordan? And God tells Joshua, he says, get the ark, get the priests to carry the ark, and they have to be a certain distance ahead of the other people. And he says, tell them to go to the brink of the Jordan to set their foot in the water, and whenever they do that, the way will open. And they went, you know, this great distance ahead of everybody else, and they prepared, they opened the way that God would have for them to go through. Can I suggest to you this morning, you hear from God whenever you're close to God. And generally, God will move through people that are drawing near to him. Remember whenever Jesus, and I mentioned this to you before, they're at the Last Supper, and they're all gathered around that table, you know, crouched on the floor, the way they would have celebrated that supper. There's Jesus in the midst. They're all around him. And whenever he begins to reveal what's going to happen about someone betraying, about people forsaking him and stuff like that, they signal to John. John's the disciple whom Jesus loved. John is the one, the Bible says, whose head rested upon the Lord's breast. And they signaled to John to ask Jesus who he's talking about. And friends, what a truth there is in that. God reveals his will. God speaks his heart to those who draw close to him. Remember on that other occasion, whenever he's thinking about the cities of the plain. Sodom and Gomorrah, and his judgment's about to fall. And we have that tremendous little verse where God speaks of, about Abraham. And he talks about his friend Abraham. Shall I withhold from Abraham that thing which I do? And you see, God came and he stopped. You know, they visited Abraham and his tent there at Mamre. And they visited with him and sojourned with him for a short time before they went on to execute the judgment of God. Why? Because God reveals his heart to those who are closest to him. 
And so we see in this story, it's the priesthood that's to signal the will. It's the priesthood that's to signal the mind of God, who are to blow with these trumpets. It was the high and the holy privilege of the priestly family because they clustered around the sanctuary of God. You see, all of the tribes had their position. But the Levites, the priesthood, they were in the middle. They were in the vicinity of where the tabernacle actually would have been erected. And it was them who had the privilege of catching the first movement of the cloud and then communicate this to the most distant parts of the camp. The priesthood, those who were close to God. They were responsible to communicate a distinct sound, to communicate a a certain sound. And as we've already said, every member of the host was equally responsible to obey the trumpet blast. Can you imagine for a moment, suppose the trumpet sounded and the camp was to move and somebody decided, well, I'm not going to bother doing that. The camp would have moved ahead. The presence of God would have moved ahead. The people of God would have followed after God. And that person or that family would have been left completely cut off, vulnerable, isolated, because they had chosen to disobey the sound that had been heralded to them, uh, expressing what the will of God was. And so the whole process was very simple. The whole process was very, very practical. And they had no difficulty in seeing its force. We have no difficulty in seeing even its force and its application in the case of the congregation of Israel there in the wilderness. But friends, we have to remember that this is all a type. This is something that happened in the past, but it's something that is a a type. And further, the Bible says these things are written for our learning. There's much that we find in the Old Testament that's there in shadow, it's there in type, that reveals something to us in the church age today about how we should function, about how we should live, about what God wants to show, what God wants to do for us. And so this is a type and this is a shadow that speaks to us today. And so it's fitting for a time that we look at this and just seek to gather up a few thoughts, really, with regards to this whole situation. You see, there's a very, a very relevant truth here for our present day. And that truth is simply this. The fact that God's people then were absolutely dependent upon completely surrendering to the Lord in all of their movements. They were absolutely dependent upon the Lord for everything that they needed out there in the wilderness. And folks, the same truth is relevant for you and me today as well. We are dependent upon the Lord for absolutely everything. We are dependent upon Him for His provision. And we also are called to be completely surrendered to the Lord in all of our movements. Now, I want to give you a little scenario today. And I want you to think about your life for just a moment. Now, I want you to take your car away. You've got no car. I want you to take your house away. You have no house. I want you to take your bank account away so you have no money. I want you to take your employment away. Remember, they're in the wilderness here. So you have no way of making money. I want you to take away your refrigerator that's packed full of food. I want you to take away your freezer that's packed full of food for next month. I can remember one time, a number of years ago, we had a girl over from an orphanage in Kenya. She spent a couple of weeks. She didn't spend it with us, but but we were involved. And, you know, she did a meeting uh, in our assembly at that time. And, you know, do you know one of the things that she testified that night? She says, what an amazing country this is. She says, you open your refrigerator and it's packed full of food. And she says, you open a freezer and it's packed full of more food. She says, the houses in this country have enough food to do them for three, four, maybe five, six weeks. She says, we don't know where our next meal's coming from. What a truth that is. 
But I want you to think about your life. Now, this is your life. And all of that stuff's gone. Remember these people, they're journeying through the wilderness. There's no employment. There's no way of making money. There's no mode of transport. They don't even know where they're going to. They don't know how long they're going to be in one place. They don't know when they're going to have to pack up and move on to some other location. And goodness only knows where that's going to be. And their whole life is completely dependent, as I've said, completely dependent upon God's provision and completely dependent upon surrendering to obey what God wants them to do. Now bring that back to your life and everything's gone. Everything's stripped away. Can I ask you lovingly today, how would that change your life? Would that change your life? You see, if you didn't know where your next meal was going to come from, and you had no way of providing that meal, would that change your spirit, your life? Now, you can answer that for yourself. Would that change the way you pray? Listen, I want to tell you something. I have lived by faith. We know what that's like. I know what it's like to have bills sitting upon the table and no money to pay them. And to be living completely by faith depending upon God to provide, to meet that need. Now if you were in that situation, let me ask you again, would that change your prayer life? Would that change your walk with the Lord? Would that change your attitude to the Lord, would it? Because, friends, I believe, you know, we talk about depending upon the Lord. We talk about how we're saved and praise God for that. And we talk about how we depend upon Him for life and for, you know, getting on in life. But do we really depend upon the Lord? Because if the truth's been told in this nation, we don't, folks. Do we? And if you're sitting here this morning and all of that stuff was stripped away out of your life, and you're examining your spiritual walk and your prayer life and your obedience and your submission to the Lord, and you're examining all of that and thinking in your mind now, if all of that stuff was taken out of my life, my life would have to change drastically. Then I'm asking you this morning, why do you live the way you live without changing it now? You see, we live in a nation where the church isn't close to God. We live in a nation where the church doesn't really hear from God. We're talking earlier about the priesthood, those who were closest to him. They would get the first movings of God. They would be the first to receive what the Lord wanted to say. But we're living at a time in the age of the church when the church isn't living close to God. We're living at a time in this nation when we have people encamped all around us, waiting, needing to to hear a distinct sound from the God of heaven. And we who are supposed to be priests and kings unto our God are not living close enough to him to get something distinct from heaven. Can I ask you today, what has God said to you? Personally, this week? Here's a big question. Let me maybe put it another way. Has God said anything to you this week? You see, folks, if everything was stripped away from us, the lives that we're so accustomed to, the lives that we're, we're so used to living, the stuff that accommodates us, the stuff that we depend upon, if all of that was taken away, How would we live our lives? Could we make it through? Or would we have to make some drastic adjustments spiritually in order to make it through? The children of Israel, they dared not assemble for any festive or for any religious purpose until the trumpet sounded. Nor could the men of war buckle on their armor until they were summoned to do so. 
And so they worshipped and they fought. They journeyed and they halted. In simple obedience to the trumpet call. It was not by any means a question of whether they liked it or whether they disliked it. It wasn't a matter of what their thinking was or their opinions or their judgments. It was simply a matter of complete obedience to what God was saying to them. And friends, this is something that is so relevant to our age. An age in the history of the church when even amongst God's people, there is so much in subjection to divine authority and to the word of God. I'll take it, I'll leave it. Sometimes there's even positive resistance amongst God's people to the truth of the word of God. Whenever it demands unqualified obedience and it demands self-surrender. You see, it's fine whenever the truth being presented speaks of our pardon. And it speaks of our acceptance with God. It's fine whenever the truth being presented speaks of our our righteousness through our Lord Jesus Christ. Or speaks of our eternal security in Christ. We know we're on our way to glory. And nothing can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. It's fine whenever those truths are being presented. It's all listened to. And it's all delighted in. But the very moment that it becomes a question of the claims and a question of the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ upon us. Boy, we come up with all sorts of excuses. We can come up with all sorts of reasons as to why we can't do this or we can't do that or we can't be there or we can't be something else. We can make all of the excuses. They come out of us. They run out of us so easily. And that's what's evident in the church today. Friends, I believe that the Bible makes it abundantly clear that the Lord wants to direct our paths. Do you believe that today? Well, let me ask you this. Where did he direct you to this week? That's a big question. In your personal walk, where did he direct you this week? How did he lead you? What did he lead you to do? What did he say to you this week? What direction did he take you? What did he achieve through your life this week? See, he wants to direct our paths, and it's so easy to pay lip service to all of these things that the Scripture, you know, we're we're just thinking of the prayer meeting this morning. I think it was John prayed. We know all the theology, and it's so true. And we can pay easy lip service to all of that stuff. But folks, let's be honest about it. How much of that stuff is really working in my life and in your life every single day? Every single day. Is the Lord leading your life? Is the Lord directing your life? And as a church of the Lord Jesus Christ today, do we hear his voice? Do we know the direction he's taken us? Do we know what he's trying to say in our midst? That we might be a blessing. That we might be able to herald it out to those who stand in need of hearing it. You see, today, as the church of Jesus Christ, we are in a much more blessed position than Israel ever was. Because we no longer need to listen to some distant trumpet. Folks, we have the Word of God. We have the Holy Spirit who has come to live, who has come to to dwell within us. And we are in a position that means we should have much clearer guidance from the Lord. The question is, have we? The question is, have you? Have I? That clear guidance. But you see, all of this teaches to us, or teaches us, is that if we say we are dependent upon the Lord, listen to me, that means that we should never make a move. We should never act. We should never do anything apart from his divine testimony. We need to be waiting upon the Lord. We need to be following on to know the Lord. The Bible says it's in him we live and we move and we have our being. Is that true in your life and my life? Or is that just something that's written on the page that we pay lip service to? In him we live. Do we really? 
You see, we could be saved and going to eternity, but we could be living for self. And then we move. We could be saved, we could be part of the family of God, but we could still be doing our own thing. And him we have our being. Oh, well, I'm, I'm eternally secure anyway. And you know, there's great grace. And we can pay lip service to so much of this stuff, but it's down to the nitty gritty where the rubber meets the road. Is this stuff evident in our old lives? His word lays before us the truth of our position in him. His word lights the path before us that our feet are to follow in him. His word gives the the, the pattern for our lives. His word assures us that we are, have an eternal destiny that's all captured in him. And his Holy Spirit has come to dwell within us, to comfort us, to lead us, to guide us, listen, to get rid of self and to make us more like him. Oh, we're in a much more privileged position than Israel ever was in. And the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, he communicates the Father's mind to us as an assembly and also as an individual believer. But friends, the questions we need to ask ourselves again is this. Are we waiting upon God for his guidance? Are we listening for his voice? Do we expect to hear his voice? Whenever you leave this service today, Would you expect to hear God on your own today sometime? Will you? Will I? Are we expecting? Are we listening? Are we seeking His divine will continually in our lives? Expecting Him to lead and guide the way His Word says He will do. In 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 16 and 17 it says... All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Listen to this. That the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Is that what's happening in your life? Is that what's happening in my life? You see, folks, these are the issues. And yet God has placed at our disposal all that we need in order that we might be led, in order that we might be guided. And he can meet our need in every situation. Do you know whatever God does is perfect? I don't believe God ever gives half measure. I don't believe God ever does anything. Imperfection is is not a word that's in the vocabulary of God that refers to himself. Everything that he does is, is perfect. If God undertakes to provide for anyone, then that provision must of necessity be perfect. So God's provision for your salvation, God's provision for your daily life, God's provision for your leading, for your guiding is absolutely perfect. But the question is, we're so imperfect and we fail to close in. We fail to to come close enough to him to really allow him to lead us. You see, the psalmist David, in the 23rd Psalm, David could say, the Lord is my shepherd. Can I ask you today, can you say that? Is the Lord your shepherd? And you're sitting there and you're saying, yes, I'm saved. I can say that. And if you're saved, praise God, you can say that. The Lord is my shepherd. And you see, here's what I'm getting at. If we can declare that truth today, speaking about our own lives, about our own situation, if we can say the Lord is my shepherd, then the truth of the rest of that verse has also got to be true as well. If he is my shepherd, then I shall not want. Are you lacking anything today? And maybe if you are, it's because he's not really your shepherd. Oh, saved, yes, but not close. Not listening. Not being led. Not being submissive enough. Not being obedient enough. Just all of the stuff that we've been thinking here that Israel, uh, w- w- that was demanded of Israel to do. Moving without God. 
not incorporating him into every single aspect of everyday life. And furthermore, you will find in the word of God that everywhere God's Holy Spirit was, there was always power. How's the power in your life? Does he live within you? Okay, how's the power? What's your power like against sin? What's your power like whenever it comes to to stand up and testify for Jesus? What's your power like in the midst of situations where where the enemy would would, would try to, to put you down or try to sneer the name of the one who hung upon the cross for you and me? What's your power like in that situation to stand up and be counted for Jesus? Because everywhere that he has been in the word of God, there's always power. This morning, the Holy Spirit, he's alive in us. And that means that our lives, we possess a power. Now, the Holy Spirit is not a thing. He is not a power. The Holy Spirit is a person. He's God. But he brings with him God's divine power. Hallelujah. And that should be a part of your life. And it should be a part of mine. A power that enables us to live for the Lord. A power that enables us to speak for the Lord. To witness to others about the Lord. A power that can be called upon in all situations of life. But friends, the question has got to be asked, are we listening for his voice? Are we waiting upon him? Are we obeying his commands? Are we submissive to what he wants us to do? In Ephesians 5 and 18, we know the verse so well. The verse says to be filled with the Spirit. In Galatians 5 and 16, we are commanded to walk in the Spirit. It says if we do that, we'll not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. God has made provision for you and for me in His Holy Spirit who comes to live within us, to lead us, to give us the promptings of God, to guide us, to direct us, to do everything that the trumpet blast was to do to the nation of Israel. We have all of that incorporated in Him deep down within us. Can I ask today, how do we really walk? Friends, how do we? How do we really walk in the light of all of that? He has completely provided for our every need So that we who are the people of God might be those whose lives are filled with power. Those whose hearts are on fire for God. Are we like that? Are we like that? Those whose actions, those whose actions are in complete obedience to his word and to his spirit. And as the children of Israel obeyed, his presence was in their midst. Now, as I've said earlier, supposing the cloud moved and someone decided, I'm not going to do that. Where would they end up at? And yet we feel it in our Christian walk, we can take it or leave it. We can decide for it or against it. Let's have a vote on it. Will we go with Jesus or will we leave that one off? Because we can do without that trouble. That infringes too much in my comfort. That infringes too much in my modern lifestyle. That infringes far, far too much on all of the stuff that I've accumulated around me. My time. That infringes too much. And yet all of the time, God in his words saying, you know, if you want my presence, if you want my power, you've got to be close to me and you've got to submit and obey everything that I ask you to do. And as they obeyed, His presence was in their midst. Friends, can we do anything less than that? Can we? We need to listen to him. We need to obey his every command. And he will lead us. He will lead you. Can I say this morning that perhaps in your Christian walk, if you're a loose end, or perhaps if you feel that you've gone as far as far as you'll ever go, then for you, dear one, listen to me, please. It's time to get on your knees and wait before the Lord. And it's time to get your life in line with Him. And it's time to seek His face until He speaks. Until He tells you what the next step is to take. 
until he shows you what direction you've got to go next. Do you know what the Bible says? Listen to this. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Are you being led by him? Because, dear ones, that's what he expects. That's what he expects. And we're living at this loose time in the church, and I'm finishing, but we're living at this loose time in the church whenever the church expects to be able to live whatever way it wants to live. Saved, praise God. But let's just live whatever way we like. But where's the presence of God? Where's the ministry of the miraculous? Where's the needs being met that need to be met? Where's the families being saved or loved ones that need to be saved? Where's the manifestation of the power of God? And we wonder why God doesn't answer. And yet he's there, still the same. But you and I, the church in general, we choose to go our own way. We choose to do our own thing. And we expect God to show up anyway. Folks, that's not scriptural. That's not how it works. And thank God today for his grace and praise God for the cross of Calvary. But that's not the scripture of my word, my Bible. Because my Bible says we have got to acknowledge him in all of our ways. And he shall praise God. He shall direct our paths. The Bible says no good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. Whenever we learn to walk right uprightly before him, praise God, he'll begin to show up with the things that we feel we're in need of. The fault doesn't lie with our Savior, but the fault lies squarely upon your shoulders and upon mine. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Folks, listen to me, please. It's time to open up our hearts. It's time to get real with God. It's time to get serious about our spirit, your relationship with Him. Not to go through the motions. Forgive me, and I've said this before, I don't want to go through the motions. I don't. I just don't want to do that. I want God. I want His presence. I want God to manifest His glory whenever we meet together. I want to seek to walk with him in such a way that we can hear what he wants to say and that we have a message for the people around us that will be cutting-edge stuff that will convict them of sin whenever they hear it. But our message has lost its power and we've lost our way and we've lost our communication with God and we've lost the reality of God's presence because we choose to do whatever. And all of the time he says, the trumpet blasts. Or the Holy Spirit leads. Now I leave that with you today. And you've got to determine in your own life. Where you stand with that. But I'm laying this before you. Because forgive me. I believe with all of my heart. That God spoke this to me. And I'm leaving this with you once again. Take away everything in your life that you're used to. And place yourself in the same position as these wandering people would have been in, where they're depending absolutely upon God for everything. Take it all away. Put yourself in their position and ask yourself, how would your life, how would my life need to change in order to walk and follow God in that way? Because folks, listen to me. That's where we should be living. And if we were living right for God, and maybe you are, and God bless you, I'm not saying, you know, I'm not saying that. And if nothing needs to change in your life, well, praise God, but I want to tell you something. There's a whole lot has to change in mine. And I'd be the first to hold my hand up. And I think I try to live for the Lord. But that's where he wants us at. Put ourselves in that position. Strip everything else away. And then determine in our lives what would need to change. If your next meal depended upon God, would you pray more? Would you pray more earnestly? If your provision for tomorrow depended on how God would lead you, 
Would you wait more upon the Lord and seek to surrender more to his word? Because if changes have to be made like that, then we've got to be big enough to say, we need to make the changes anyhow. Because if changes need to be made, that means we're not living now the way we should be living. And I believe God speaks to our hearts that truth this morning. The Bible says, let a man examine himself. Let a man examine himself. And I know we're talking there about the communion table. But there's a wider connection in that. Let a man examine himself. There's another place that says, and see if he be in the faith. Folks, are we playing church? Are we playing Christianity? Are we really in the faith, giving our all, depending completely upon God for all that he is for us? And you search your heart and allow the truth of that to touch you. And look to the Lord. Let's all seek to do that. And let's seek to, to put in order, set our house, so to speak, in order, in our own individual lives and experience. And then let's look to the Lord and see the difference, praise God, that that will make for us individually. That will make for us as a church. And the difference that that will make for the community in which God has placed this church. And I tell you, God can open the windows of glory and he can pour out a blessing that there won't be room enough to receive. Do you believe that today? Ah, oh, folks, praise God for that. Let's just bow in a word of prayer and then we'll sing our hymn together. Blessed Jesus. Blessed Jesus. Lord, we simply bring these things before you today. Lord, you know our hearts. And Lord, you know where we would want to be with you spiritually, in our walk, in our individual lives. Lord, you know where we would want to be with you as far as the life of this church is concerned. And Lord, we thank you for your mercy. We thank you for the things that you've done and we thank you for the things that you're doing. Lord, we praise you for that and we don't despise the day of small things. But Lord, if we're being really honest, they are small things. And yet you're a God of abundance and a God of vastness. Lord, help us in that. Move us on with you. Touch us, Lord, in a way that we will be convicted. Touch us, Lord, in a way that we will be dedicated. Touch us in a way that we will be more committed to you. To you, Lord. That our individual lives will shine. Oh, Lord, that allers will see our good works. And we will glorify our Father which is in heaven. To that end, Lord, bless your word, Lord, to our hearts today. And bless every single life that's bowed before you. Touch each one, we pray. Touch, Father, in the precious name of Jesus. And lead us on. Lord, lead us on to follow hard after you for your name's sake and for your glory. Amen. 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 Praise God.